Monique was born on December 11, 1967 in Baltimore County, Maryland to mother Alice Imes, who was an engineer, and father Stephen Imes Jr., who was a drug counselor. She is the youngest of four children. Monique was interested in performing by the time she was a toddler and was inspired by television sitcoms such as Good Times and Gilligan's Island. She has said that when watching Good Times, she pictured herself as the character Thelma, and when watching Gilligan's Island, she was Ginger. Monique was heavy as a baby and continued to be so throughout her childhood and teenage years. With her friends and family support, she always accepted her physical appearance and never let it affect her self-esteem. Monique graduated from Milford Mill High School in Baltimore County in 1985 and attended Morgan State University. She is a 1987 graduate of the Broadcasting Institute of Maryland. Monique worked as a customer service representative at the phone company MCI in Hunt Valley, Maryland. Monique began her comedy career on a dare in 1987. One of her brothers, Steve, tried his hand at stand-up comedy, but according to Monique, he wasn't very good. He bet Monique to go on stage herself at Baltimore's Comedy Factory outlet, so she came up with an hour's worth of material and performed it. Monique received a standing ovation and a new career focus. She spent two years building up her comedy career and was able to leave MCI to concentrate on comedy full-time by 1989. Monique loved the rush of performing as a stand-up comedian. She once told a publication that she loved the instant gratification that it allowed her to be selfish. When you do stand-up, it's just you. When you hit the stage, it's just you. And I love the fact that you know within five seconds if they like you. I love for people to touch me that I'm right here in your face. Now, in her obscenity-filled stand-up, Monique did not tell jokes per se, but talked about family, sex, and her own life as a plus-size woman in a funny way. Some of her comedy was extremely personal, however. Her first husband, Shalon Watkins, was physically abusive, and Monique drew on this experience for her comedy act. She did so not only for the comic value she could get out of it, but also to reach out and affect those in her audience going through the same thing. Now, a quick tea break. Monique was briefly engaged to an accountant named Kenny Mung in the early 90s. Then from 1997 to 2001, she was married to Mark Jackson. But what many do not know is that this was not Monique's first marriage. She was actually married to a man named Shalon Watkins. And in 1990, she gave birth to a son named Shalon Watkins Jr. The family of three moved to Atlanta so Monique could pursue her career as a comedian. But after two years in Atlanta, her marriage began to crumble. Monique then met and married Mark Jackson. So while Monique's online biography information lists her oldest son's name as being Shalon Jackson, taking the last name of Monique's husband, Mark, his last name is actually Watkins. He is a junior. Now, Mark and Monique, they do have a son together as well, but Shalon is not Mark's. Now, during my research, I found his SoundCloud. He has some pretty good beats on there that he has produced. Go and check the young man out. He even has a photo of him and Monique when he was a newborn. So in a few years, Monique began appearing on a number of television shows which showcase comedians. She made her television debut in 1989 on Showtime at the Apollo. Monique also appeared on Russell Simmons' Deaf Comedy Jam and BET Comic View. What's up, BET? I'm gonna let y'all know right now, baby, I am here to represent every big woman in America. Right. Every one. Every big woman. So I want every big woman in here tonight to give me a hoop one time. Now see, there's some more big asses in here other than those hoops. It is, but I ain't gonna point you out because you got to deal with that, baby. I'm gonna tell you something. I love being big. I'm proud to be big because I know I'm correct. I know my program looks good. And see, a lot of big women are scared to tell you how much they weigh, what size clothes they in. I'm gonna tell you how much I weigh because I look good and your skinny women can't touch me. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> see, because I'm on a little Jenny Craig thing and I'm trying to do my little thing because it's, you know, I want to, for next time, I'm giving to my little two piece or three piece or four piece, how many pieces I gotta use to cover it up. But I weighed in before I came out to California, baby, and I weighed in, I lost my little weight, I weighed in at 105, and I'ma tell you something, I gotta go. <laughs> I'ma tell you something, baby, ah! I'ma tell you, but you know what, 
see, one thing you will never see, you will never see two fat people together. You won't see it because it's too much work. And as fine as you are, Mr. Avery, you are a fine man. But see, me and you, we couldn't make it happen because it's too much work. I'll be looking for your stuff. You trying to find my stuff. We breathing hard, sweating. <clears throat> Let's just get a sandwich. Don't worry about it. <laughs> See, you know what? With black women, period, baby, with black women, period, we just got it going on. See, sisters, period, you know what makes it so beautiful? Black women don't give a damn. Nothing makes us a difference. That's why we got it going on. See, when the visa people call the white women, they panic. They write checks. Oh, my God. <laughs> visa called me. Tell my Monique, you know, you 30 days late. No, y'all 30 days early. <laughs> I ain't late. I told you to get my hair done. Come on, damn, give me a chance. You know, baby, see, we don't worry about that kind of stuff. And for me, I'm just a real woman. I'm a real sister. And I'm not going to say that brothers are intimidated by me, but they just think I'm nasty. I'm not nasty. I'm just real. That's all I am. Little fella called me up. He said, Monique, you know, want to take you out to dinner, get you something to eat. All right, baby, that's my thing, you know, go out to eat, you know. So, <laughs> you know, I'm going to get my eat on, baby. You know what I'm saying? I'm getting my eat on. So he said, well, look, all I got it's twenty dollars, so I, hey, baby, that's just my appetizer money. Now, what you gonna eat with? That ain't gonna do me no good. So he said, "Well, look, I'm gonna tell you right now, baby. I had a hard week. I just got money for the buffet. Can we go to the little buffet thing? So, baby, that was all you can eat. So that's something my alley, baby. So I went to the buffet, and it was all you could eat. So I ate all of it. That's what it said, and that's what I did. Okay. And you know, baby, when you eat a whole lot of food and you're in a restaurant, and after a while, that food will settle." in your stomach. I say, oh Lord, I got to go, I got to go. And I didn't want to go in the restaurant because I'd have messed it up for everybody in the restaurant, baby. So I'm just sitting there, and you know when your whole boo-boo in your stomach for a long time, it just turned to a fart, right? So I'm like, oh, I got to handle my business. So baby, I'm just sitting there, right? So I said, well, see, when we walk out to the car, I just let it out while we walk into the car, and the people behind me are getting messed up, but the brother won't know what I'm doing, baby. So I'm walking, and it just ain't coming. I'm doing, uh, 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 and it just ain't coming, baby. So I get in the car, and I'm holding my ass together as tight as I possibly can. I say, Lord, if he hit a speed bump, we're going to have a problem up in his car, baby. So I just waited till my song came on, and I slid it right out of there. Murray J came on, I'm going down. And I let it go. <laughs> BT, my name is Monique. God bless y'all. Peace. A 1997 appearance at the Montreal Comedy Festival led to Monique appearing on television, not just a comedian, but also as an actress. At the festival, she impressed talent scouts with her wit and sense of humor. She was soon being considered for acting roles, and in 1999, Monique landed a role on a television sitcom called The Parkers. Monique was cast as Kim Parker's flamboyant, man-hungry mother Nikki on the series. When speaking of Monique, series co-creator said her weight was never an issue. The execs at UPN were just excited that this woman was actually funny. The Parker soon posted better ratings than Moesha, and by 2001, it was the number one show among African American viewers, and remained so for most of the time it was on the air. Now, most critics and white audiences, however, dismissed The Parkers. Now, during the run of The Parkers, Monique continued her comedy career, and in 2001, she toured with female comedians Laura Haynes, some more, and Adele Givens as the Queens of Comedy. The tour was filmed for a popular Showtime special. Monique also regularly toured on her own every year to enthusiastic, loyal audiences. Oh, my fat ass out here, some of y'all act like you didn't want to give it up for me. I don't play that bullshit. I got on my best motherfucking outfit. I'm going to introduce my goddamn self, and y'all going to act like a bitch is here tonight. Y'all playing with the wrong motherfucker. Baton Rouge, get on your motherfucking feet and give it up for Mo Classy, Mo Sassy, Mo That's what the fuck I'm talking about. That's, y'all gotta make a bitch feel welcome. God damn it, and every 
damn fat bitch in here should have got up out that seat. I know you're gonna be a little tired, but every fat bitch in here should have got the fuck up and welcomed my fat ass to the stage. Y'all worried about these skinny bitches looking at you. Fuck these skinny bitches. Fuck your anorexic, bulimic motherfuckers. Fuck you, skinny. Fuck y'all. Fuck y'all. Look at him shaking, bitch, cause you hungry. Fuck them. Big women, it's all motherfucking time. How you doing, sister? You look fabulous, goddammit. Fuck these skinny bitches. Mm -hmm. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Big women, it's all goddamn time. Fuck that. And they told me I couldn't be a star. Shit. They got my fat ass on TV every Monday night chasing that motherfucking professor. Hey, Professor Ogilvy! When I catch his ass, I'ma fuck the shit out of him. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. <laughs> Monique appeared as Nikki Parker on season three and episode one of The Hughleys. And in addition, Monique launched a film acting career as the Parkers and her comedy tours brought her more attention. She appeared in her first film in 2000 called Three Strikes. Then in 2001, she starred in Baby Boy and two can play that game. In 2002, she played in the movie Half Past Dead and voiced the character of Boonetta on season two, episode one of The Proud Family. It was in the same year that Monique served as the host of the 2002 season of It's Showtime at the Apollo. Now Monique's first play was the production of the Vagina Monologues in March of 2002. Starring alongside Ella Joyce, Wendy Raquel Robinson, and Vanessa Bell Calloway, they were the first all-black celebrity cast to perform the Vagina Monologues. Outside of show business, Monique also expanded her interests. She founded a plus-size clothing company, Monique's Big, Beautiful, and Loving It, in 2000. Monique designed some of the line's pieces, which included business casual, dressy, and evening wear, before the company folded in 2002. She published a book in 2003, Skinny Women Are Evil, Notes of a Big Girl in a Small-Minded World. Now critics wrote of the book, the book in which she hilariously riffs on business dinners with vegetarians and the perils of plus side togs is a fluffy read, but it's also filled with the staunch determination that's been vital to her success in Hollywood. Monique also hosted the 2003 BET Award Show. Uh, what, I mean, what is that? We see you sitting here, yin yangy. <laughs> Spell it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, I got this, player. I got this, player. Yes, indeed. See how our cousins do at the cookout. See how they do at the cookout? There's one cousin at the cookout that will upset everybody. It's like, why he had to come? <laughs> I love you, brother. So proud of what you're doing. Keep doing your thing. You understand me? <laughs> Y'all take your birth control pills, please. <laughs> Don't skip a day. That's what happens every single day. Please take <laughs> You know why I love hosting this show? Because it's nothing but a party. We have so much fun here at the BET Awards. It's just a big house party. The Parkers ended its run in May of 2004 with Monique's character marrying one of her love interests. When speaking about the end of the show, Monique told Jet Magazine, it was just time. The Parkers went out at the top of the game. We don't want nobody to send us away like we are tired of them. I think we did what we were supposed to do. For five years, we made you laugh, and now you can laugh for 50 years. After the end of the Parkers, Monique continued to tour as a comedian, as well as take on more film roles. In 2004, she had significant roles in Soul Plane. We don't give a damn about who you are. And Hair Show. You sister girl, you be rocking that thing. Do not, not encourage her. Peaches fall back, all right? This is a professional environment. Yes, ma'am, it is, Miss yes, Girl. It is. Zora, Zora, do you like the you. earrings with this? Well, you know what? The earrings are uh, funky. Nobody like... asked you. 
peaches. Okay, girl, but they just don't go with the shoes real good. That dress is red. Don't rock those gold shoes, baby. Rock red shoes. You don't like the shoes? Set it off. Set it on fire. Bam. <laughs> oh, Shamba. Why are you entertaining someone who's wearing <laughs> floral pants? <laughs> So last season. <laughs> Look, sweetie, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let you set for a moment and then I'll come back and touch up the ends. Okay. All right. Touch up. <laughs> uh, Rushamba, girl, you just got a little spot right in the back of your on your ends. If you let me do it, baby, There's I will spot? tighten it up. Yes, I got you. Where? <laughs> I'm the proprietor of this establishment. Yeah, well, get me the owner. I am the owner. Oh, well, me and my crew, we here for this buy one, get one free early bird special right here. And we got our own hair and everything. Uh, I don't do weaves. What? What you mean you don't do no weaves? I don't do weaves. Well, somebody up in this joint better start weaving, or some gonna jump off up in here. Uh, Ooh, you know. I got four heads of handling over here. You gonna have to handle these little hood rats yourself. No way! If you ain't weaving, you need to be leaving. Judy, where all these people come from? PJ client and she not here. Peaches clients. My people, my people. RuPaul wanna be? I know you ain't talking to me. Make yourself comfortable. You got your people mixed up. Okay, Angel. Okay. All right. Angel, what do we do? Juni, you handle the front. Simone, you take the twist and the braid. What about me? Gianni, you take the color and the perms. Tiffany, the weaves. What about me? Drake. I already got mine. Drake, thank you. I need you to man the shampoo line. Hello? Hello? When's somebody gonna start doing what this paper say right here? This flyer say, buy one, get one free. Right. I'm here for my free. So where's it at? What's going on? Excuse me, Mrs. Oh, Mrs. Mrs. Look, you can stop all that switching and start stitching, okay? What you think? Wow, Peaches, this is amazing. <laughs> I am so glad you like it. Now, I added a couple tracks in it to give it fullness and flair. Excuse me. What in the hell is going on here? Oh, Zora, don't be mad. Peaches was just trying to help. It All right, Zora, listen, I'm ready to go. Is everybody ready? Uh-huh. Oh. What do you think about the hair? The hair is nice. Oh! Look at you. All right, I'm are ready we ready go? in just a second? I Monique also voiced the character in Garfield the movie, voicing the role of the rat but her role was cut from the movie. At this time, even though her BBLI fashion line had failed, she returned to fashion in 2005 as the Just My Size spokesperson and the brand's face. As part of this collaboration, she had a special on Oxygen, Monique's Fat Chance. This program focused on a beauty pageant hosted by Monique for full-figured women. The point of Monique's Fat Chance was to celebrate women as they are. In 2004, she hosted the BET Awards again, with her opening performance being Beyonce's single, Crazy in Love. She appeared as Lynette on Season 3, Episode 1 of The Bernie Mac Show. In 2005, she played in the movie Shadow Boxer, in which she played a junkie named Precious. Monique also had a dramatic role in the thriller Domino as Leticia Rodriguez. She made a cameo as herself on Season 5, Episode 16 of Girlfriends. Monique's family also was expanding during this time. Already a mother of two sons, one from each of her first two marriages, Monique gave birth to twins in late 2005. Their father was Sidney Hicks, a childhood friend whom she married in May of 2006. Taking some time off from her acting career, Monique continued to tour as a comedian. Baby, 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 
Did y'all see them motherfuckers carry me out here? Y'all know a bitch was scared of shit! I mean, what the fuck I'm supposed to do? What the fuck am I supposed to do? But I felt like motherfucking royalty up on the little shit. The one nigga in the back was shaking. I say, nigga, go do some sit-ups when you come back and get my fat ass off this motherfucker. Just shaking. Baby, I am in Biloxi, Mississippi. Home of the motherfucking big girl. That's what I'm talking about. Home of y'all fat asses, baby. This is the goddamn South where we eat what the fuck we want to eat. We eat that real shit. We eat that fresh shit. We eat fresh motherfucking pig. Fuck that store brought shit. We'll kill a motherfucking pig in the backyard. Bitch, catch it, bitch, catch it. Yes, baby. Yes, baby. Yes, big girls, y'all all out here with your husbands and your dates. Valentine's Day. I see some of you skinny bitches nervous as a motherfucker. Y'all looking all right here at this motherfucking leg, baby. This is a motherfucking leg. Bam! Better lamb! This can knock a nigga here now. Why? Come on, I can't hear, nigga. You don't need to, nigga. You don't need to. <laughs> oh, baby. Oh, baby. My motherfucking people. And you know what? I feel the nervous energy. I feel it. I feel it. You skinny bitches is looking at me like, please. Please don't let this bitch say nothing to me, please. please. Please, you know the fuck I am. I'ma say what the fuck I wanna say, you frail motherfuckers. They ain't skinny bitches no more, they frail bitches. Weak, easily to bend. Bitches is just frail. Big girls, I love every fucking thing about you. And I know some of y'all looking at me like, Mo, you lost some weight. I did. I lost two pounds, but goddammit, before I leave this motherfucker, I'ma get them back. Trust when I tell you I'm going to get them back. She then published a second book, which was a cookbook. Published in 2006, Skinny Cooks Can't Be Trusted emphasized cooking with hearty ingredients, such as whole milk, butter, cream, and sugar. Monique also included her own childhood food memories in addition to recipes. During this time, Monique occasionally filled in for afternoon radio personality Michael Basden on DC's WHUR radio show with George Wilburn. Returning to the big screen in 2006, Monique lent her voice to the animated Farce of the Penguins and appeared in the comedy Beer Fest. She also was both the star and executive producer of Fat Girls. In the comedy, she played Jasmine Biltmore, a department store worker who comes to fully embrace her plus size status, though society does not. The film is ultimately a celebration of accepting who you are, especially if you are full figured. Now, when speaking of fat girls, critics commented that Monique, whose previous film roles have been mostly loud, over the top cameos, shows more range here, and her likability in the quieter moments makes her violent outbursts that much more funny. Fat girls cost $3 million to produce, with the film earning back its production costs in the first weekend of release. For the cartoon series Rugrats, she voiced a character, Aunt Moo, on a DVD episode, Tales from the Crib, Three Jacks and a Beanstalk. In 2007, Monique came back to television with the Showtime special, Monique, I Could Have Been Your Cellmate, which chronicled her stand-up performance at the Ohio Reformatory for Women. Cause I just had babies, two little boys, David, and Jonathan. Thank you, babies. Thank y'all. Yeah. And I got to tell y'all, when I went to the doctors, right, and I get there, they got these soft candles burning, soft music. I said, bitch, that's why I'm here. Blow that shit out. That's why I'm in this motherfucker now. So jokingly, I said to my fiance, when they walked out the room, I said, Sid, what if they come back and tell us we're having twins? And we started laughing. That bitch came back in there. <laughs> and you know how you up in the stirrups when you're getting your checkup? Can you scoot down a little bit, please? <laughs> bitch, can you scoot up some shit? I can't scoot down. I'm a big gal. I'm a fall of fuck off of this table now. That's enough scooting. How much scooting do you want a bitch to do? 
So I put up on the table and she put the little gel, you know, on my stomach to check to see, you know, the baby. And she said, oh my God, oh my God. Y'all know she was white, that's how y'all talk. Oh my God, oh my God. I said, bitch, what is wrong? She said, I can't find a heartbeat. I said, I'm a big gal, bitch, give me some more gel. Them babies might be in my fucking bag, stop playing. So she put all the gel shit on my stomach. Then she says, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you know black nurse would have been like, bitch, do you see this shit? It's two motherfuckers in there, bitch. Ooh. <laughs> so all the doctors came to me and said, well, Monique, because you're having multiples, you won't go to 40 weeks in your pregnancy. We're gonna have to take the babies at 35 weeks. I'm cool with that. Okay. Now we scheduled my C-section automatically because I don't believe in that kind of pain, baby. Mm -mm. <laughs> Peace should only come out. That's the only thing. And dick should go in and that's two things. scheduled my c-section at 28 weeks my babies decided we're not going to wait to 35 weeks we are ready to come out of here now so i get up go to the bathroom and when i'm great open the door my water breaks now i ain't had a kid in 15 years so i couldn't remember <laughs> if that was my water breaking or if a bitch was peeing on herself because <laughs> y'all know we're peeing on ourselves bitch like oh bitch i'm peeing bitch oh bitch i'm peeing bitch Stand in front of me, bitch, I'm peeing. <laughs> yes, baby. So I say, Sid, my water done broke. He say, nah, bitch, you're probably peeing. I can't cut it off. This shit ain't pee. So they rushed me to the hospital. Everybody's panicking. They get me up on the table. They shoot me up with steroids because they want me to hold on to these babies. Because they said, Monique, they're not fully developed. We've got to keep these babies inside. So for a whole week, I get to 29 weeks, they come back and they say, Monique, we've got to take them. Infection is setting in, and we can't break your fever. Now, I believe in that thing we call God, so I said, I submit. Whatever you're going to do, you're going to do. Ain't shit I can do about this at this point. So they came on in. Now, as we're going to the operating room, I start praying. I said, hey, God, it's me. What's going to happen, going to happen. But I've been watching the TLC channel. I see some shit that can go wrong. Don't be tripping, God. Now, don't give my babies three eyes. I promise you, I won't look at them. I will be looking over here. They will be laying right there. How y'all doing? <laughs> Fuck that. So at 10.15, they start the surgery. 10.27 p.m., here comes David. He's two pounds. 10.30 p.m., here comes Jonathan. He's three pounds. Now, I can't fully turn my head over because I'm a little nervous what my baby's going to look like. So I say, Sid, what they look like, nigga? He said, bitch, if you don't turn your crazy ass over here and look at these motherfuckers, ain't nothing wrong with their ass. They trying to run out of here. They trying to run away from your crazy ass. So the little nurse began to panic. And when you panic, it makes me nervous. I wanted to punch that bitch in her face. I could easily be your cellmate, baby. From the hospital to the jailhouse, easily I could have been in here. But I'm proud to say, Jonathan is now 25 pounds and David is 23 pounds. Yes, baby. My babies are good. The program also featured Monique talking with some of the inmates about their lives. When speaking of the project, she said, when you hear their stories, it allows you to quit being judgmental. You can see through it all, they could smile. It was incredible. As much as I thought I was going to go in there and do something for those women, they did so much for me. Monique returned again to the 2007 BET Awards show. She performed Beyonce's Deja Vu. Later that year, Monique played a key role in Flavor of Love Girls Charm School, a reality transformation show on VH1. 
taking contestants rejected on previous editions of the popular reality show Flavor of Love, Monique guided the women through etiquette and manners, training as well, and other areas of self-improvement. When the program began airing in April of 2007, it instantly became VH1's most popular program. In 2007, she had a guest starring role on the hit television series, Ugly Betty. She also voiced the character Jamika on season two, episode one of The Boondocks. She appeared in the 2008 comedy film, Welcome Home, Roscoe Jenkins with Martin Lawrence. Also in that year, she appeared on The Oprah Winfrey Show. And when speaking about Martin Lawrence, she said that Martin gave her invaluable advice about show business. He pulled me to the side and he said, listen, don't ever let them tell you what you can't have. Since that day, I've made some of the best deals I've ever made in my career because it keeps ringing in my head. It will stay with me forever. In 2009, she played Aunt Carla in the movie Steppin, the movie. It was in that year that Monique starred in the independent drama Precious, based on the novel Push by Sapphire, directed by Lee Daniels. For the role, she was paid $50,000. She won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. Monique stated in her acceptance speech, I'd like to thank the Academy for showing that it can be about the performance and not the politics. On April 5th, 2009, her own late night talk show, The Monique Show, aired on BET. It lasted for two seasons from 2009 to 2011, airing 251 episodes. In 2014, Monique played Claire Rousseau in the movie Blackbird. She also appeared on two episodes of season four of the reunion special of Love and Hip Hop New York. She played Ma Rainey in the TV film Bessie in 2015. In 2018, Monique accused Netflix of racial and gender bias against her after she was paid $500,000 for her comedy special to air on the streaming service. She asked that people take a stand with her and boycott Netflix. In all that she has done, Monique remains committed to being true to herself and not an unreachable star. She once told Jet Magazine, I thank God for the blessings, for the talent, and for using me to make people laugh. I never want to be a celebrity where people feel like I'm untouchable. I want people to know that I'm just like you are. Now that was the Wikipedia version, the safe version, the popular opinion. Now let's get to the T, what we all came here for. Now, there is no denying that Monique is an undeniable talent. Her resume speaks for itself. But the question that is on everyone's mind is, what happened? Why is Monique's career stagnant? An Academy Award, playing countless venues, why is she not farther ahead than what she is? No one in Hollywood wants to deal with her. Nobody wants to take a chance on her. Her and her husband, manager, Signe Hicks, have been labeled as difficult 
and hard to work with. But where did that narrative come from? Surely this is not something that just comes out of thin air. Well, let's see. Could it be the attempt to boycott Netflix, the shade thrown in her Oscars speech, the public rants and accusations made against Whoopi Goldberg, Roland Martin, Steve Harvey, Cheryl Underwood, Charlemagne the God, Kim Whitley, and Will Packer, and most recently, D.L. Hughley? Did I miss anyone? And by now, everyone has heard that the three heavy hitters, Oprah Winfrey, Tyler Perry, and Lee Daniels, are actually the ones to blame for her failing career. Now, Monique has stood firm in her accusations that the trio has had her blacklisted for not campaigning for the movie Precious. But does the blame really lie with them? Does it all rest there? Monique's Beef with Oprah in 2009, Monique starred in Precious, which was directed by Lee Daniels. When the film started to receive attention and buzz from Monique's performance, the film's executive producers Tyler Perry and Oprah Winfrey, as well as the film's production company Lionsgate, asked Monique to travel to promote the film at the Cannes Film Festival, which she declined to do, saying her deal was with the film's director, Lee Daniels, and that she had finished her contractual obligations. Because she did not do what Tyler and Oprah asked of her, Monique said the duo blackballed her and she has not been able to gain opportunities ever since, having been labeled as difficult. But Monique's beef with Oprah goes deeper than this. In fact, Monique has said that Oprah needs to publicly apologize for what she has done. She will have a problem with Oprah until the day she leaves this earth. Now, what was it that Oprah did? During a 2008 Essence Magazine interview, Monique revealed that she was sexually assaulted by her brother, Gerald. The abuse started when Monique was seven, and she says it continued until she was 11. She was the baby in the family, and her brother was the oldest child. He was nearly 10 years older than she was. Monique says he molested her four times over the course of the next four years after taking her into the bathroom and giving her candy when she was 15 she says she finally told her parents because something violent happened and she won't say what it was she says i was molested by my older brother and even when i confronted him and told my parents he said i was lying and nothing was really done her brother went on to sexually abuse another girl and was sentenced to 12 years in prison. After her twin boys were born in 2005, Monique cut off all contact with Gerald. Well, on April 19, 2010, Monique's brother admitted to Oprah that he did do this to Monique. He said that he was also abused by the family and struggled with substance abuse. Well, Monique feels that when Oprah had her brother on the show, she exploited her family's issues. Monique explained the situation in an interview with Comedy Hype, saying, Oprah Winfrey called us up and she said my brother wanted to come on the show and talk about him molesting me. And he wanted to tell other parents how to look out for molesters. And Monique says she knows her brother as a charmer. She says, I didn't want nothing to do with that cat. The nigga I know is up to a scam. Now, Monique didn't block her brother's opportunity, but didn't want to be involved with it. After speaking with Oprah about the possible episode, she says she respected the fact that she called her first until she found out that it was going to be more than just her brother on the show. Monique says, now I begin to see commercials with my mother, with my brother, my father, and my other brother that used to be my manager. Now, the reason why that means so much is because in the conversation we had about my brother, we then went deeper and we began to talk about our relationships with our mothers and our fathers. And I shared my relationship with her about my mother. I shared with her that me and my mother were not talking. I shared with her that we were in a really bad place. I shared with her that I was hurt and trying to figure this thing out. She never said my mother was coming on the show because had she, Oprah Winfrey said, I'm going to have your mother, I would have said, shut it down. I don't need the world seeing how greedy my mother is. Shut that down. That's one of the reasons why we don't communicate because of my mother and father's greed. 
Monique was so upset to find that her entire family's presence on the episode had not been discussed with her. Monique said her mother appeared greedy, her father was visibly drunk, and she said her brother was scamming viewers. Her other brother, that had one time been her manager, but she had to fire, was also on the show. Oprah called her after the show and Monique said she was so upset, but she still was stuck on the fact that she was talking to Oprah Winfrey, that she did not dare share her true anger over the situation. Now her husband, Sydney, daddy, encouraged her to take off the kitty gloves and speak truthfully about her disappointment. Unfortunately, it would be years before she was able to do that. Monique said that she had tried to contact Oprah many times, but the phone number she gave were no longer in service and she could not get to Oprah. She finally confronted Oprah at an Oscars gathering in 2015. Monique says she tried to reach out prior to the event, but couldn't get her on the phone. So the host of this event encouraged Monique to say whatever was on her heart. When all the women came together to speak, Monique asked Oprah an important question in front of everyone. She said, I looked to Oprah and I said, you know you and I need to have this conversation. Why would you have my mother on your show? So for all of the women that was there that night, Monique says they know exactly what was said. And I said to her, how could you have my mother on your show? That's not what we discussed. You don't understand what position you put me in by doing that. So now this is my moment to talk to you. Then Monique says in reference to Oprah's response, and what she did was take the cowardly way out by saying, if you think I did something wrong, I want to apologize. Now that of course was not good enough for Monique as she believed Oprah had full intentions of having her family on the show without telling her so she could exploit their rocky relationship for views. Now, when speaking further about her and Oprah's conversation at the Oscar party, she said, when I say to my community, I know Oprah Winfrey when the curtains are closed. I know her when the cameras aren't running. That's why Oprah Winfrey doesn't want to sit down with me nor my husband to have a conversation because within minutes, the community would know who Oprah Winfrey really was because she's not used to anybody asking her any questions. Monique was asked if she could say anything to Oprah, what would it be? And she said, I would say, Oprah Winfrey, you know what you need to do and stop hiding behind what you call negative comments, what you call, I don't even deal with things like that because what people are beginning to do is see you for what you are. Until that woman says, let me apologize to you publicly, it will be to the day that I leave this earth because what you did was malicious and it was intentional and it was ugly. Lee Daniels. Now there was a ton of buzz about Monique being an Oscars contender after the release of Precious. And in order to increase her chances of taking home the award, she was asked to schmooze with other A-listers and promote the movie at various film festivals. However, Monique was a no-show at the New York Film Festival, and she also skipped out on the Toronto Film Festival when she was denied a $100,000 appearance fee. She says, you want me to campaign for an award? And I will say this with all the humility in the world, but you want me to campaign for an award that I didn't ask for. She also implied that the travel costs associated with promoting the film were prohibitive. And since the studio refused to pay her to make the promotional appearances, she chose not to do them. Monique said that after her decision to respectfully decline, the narrative changed to her being difficult and demanding. In an interview with CNN's Don Lemon, Monique said that sometime in 2014, she received a call from Lee Daniels. And it was during that phone call that he reportedly told her, Monique, you've been blackballed. When she asked for an explanation why, he said, because you didn't play the game. Oh, the phone was ringing and the scripts were coming. And when people say, Monique, where have you been? It's not that I haven't been on TV or been in the movies because I've been blackballed, as Mr. Mc, as Mr. Daniels has said. The offers just didn't make sense, Don. So again, the phones didn't stop ringing and the scripts didn't stop coming, but the offers that were associated with them were offers that made me say, guys, I can't accept that. Because if I accept that, 
and I won the award, what are my sisters being offered that didn't win the award or wasn't nominated? And what does it say to the little girl who's not here yet that yeah. if we continue to accept, accept these low offers, however do we make it different and make a change? Okay, I want, I want to play this. Uh, this was Lee Daniels on this very broadcast last night. Let's listen. Okay. We were on the campaign, and she was making unreasonable demands. And, uh, you know, and, I, and she wasn't thinking, this is when reverse racism, I think, happens. You know, and I said, you, you have to thank the producers of the film. You have to thank the studio. And, uh, and I think she didn't understand that. And, and I think that, uh, and I said, listen, people aren't going to respond well if you don't. If you don't. So I love her, and, I, and I've, I've spoken to her, and, I, and I, she's brilliant. She's, I, and I like working with brilliant people. But sometimes artists get in their own way. I think that um, there were demands that were made from her uh, on the Precious campaign that everyone knows about that, uh, that hurt her. And, and I told her that. Can she change that? I mean, if she plays ball, you yeah. got to play ball. That's this what, is that not, was the this question is, this I wanted is to ask you. you have to, this, is a, this is not just show. It's show business. And you've got to play ball. What's your reaction, Monique? You didn't play the game. <laughs> you, were, you had difficult well, demands. I want to address it for the order that it went in. And when Mr. Daniels say I had these demands, screen, Don, please ask him what the demands were. Mm -hmm. And actually, there were no demands. There was a request from the movie studio, and they called and requested that I fly to France for the Cannes Film Festival. I simply said I respectfully declined. Because if you can remember, at the time, there was a talk show called The Monique Show. I was doing a comedy tour. I was actually in the award season of the awards. And I'm also a wife, and I'm a mommy. So when they called, I had a couple days just downtime. I wanted to spend that with my husband and my kids. So when we said we respectfully declined, the movie studio called back again. And they said, OK, well, we'll upgrade her hotel room. And my husband simply said again, we respectfully declined. We're gonna, she's going to take this time mm -hmm. with her family. Yeah. Well, when the third call came and they said, what is it going to take to get Monique to France, to the Cannes Film Festival? And my husband said, is there a number associated with it? And they said, oh, we would never pay for anyone to do any promotions for a movie. And we said we understood because what people didn't know was I was paid $50,000 to do the movie Precious. And it really wasn't about the money, and I'm not complaining because I signed up to do it with my friend. Yeah. But so you're, when the movie you're saying that because you didn't have the money to do this on your own. Is that what you're saying? That you needed to well, feed your family and pay your bills? I think that's what America says. Yeah. I think we all say, I can't do it for free. Right. So when the movie studio says we can't set a precedence and pay you to do this, we didn't have an issue with them, okay. but that's when the reports came that now Monique is being demanding and she's being difficult. They had a request, we simply had a request, and we, they said they couldn't do it and we said we understood. That was it. Following the release of that interview, Lee issued a statement calling Monique a creative force to be reckoned with. But then he added that her demands through Precious were not always in line with the campaign. We were on the campaign, and she was making unreasonable demands. And, uh, you know, and, I, and she wasn't thinking, this is when reverse racism, I think, happens. You know, and I said, you, you have to thank the producers of the film. You have to thank the studio. And, uh, and I think she didn't understand that. And, and I think that, uh, and I said, listen, people aren't going to respond well if you don't, if you don't. So I love her, and, I, and I've, I've spoken to her, and, I, and I, she's brilliant. And I like working with brilliant people. But sometimes artists get in their own way. I think that um, there were demands that were made from her uh, on the Precious campaign that everyone knows about that, uh, that hurt her. And, and I told her that. Can she change that? I mean, if she plays ball, you've yeah. got to play ball. That's this what, is that not, was the this question is, I wanted to ask you. Have to, this, is a, this is not just show. It's show business. And you've got to play ball. As for the post-Precious roles that he had offered her, Lee said, I have and will always think of her for parts that we can collaborate on. However, the consensus among the creative teams and powers thus far were to go another way with those roles. Tyler Perry. 
Now the beef between Monique and Tyler Perry stems from her refusal to promote Precious, which was not in her contract to do. Monique said the team behind Precious urged her to campaign for the film, but she made it clear she wouldn't do it for free. What I was not going to do was to make Hollywood the priority and seeing Tyler Perry at the Steve Harvey Hoodie Awards, she said to Tyler, I'm not in the business of working for free. So we had a mutual agreement, no problem. We got up, we hugged, everything was good. When they knew that I was not going to be the actress or be the one that says, because it's them, I gotta do it. No, I don't care who it is. Now comes the blackball. Monique said that she began hearing reports that she was difficult to work with, and Tyler even went so far as to badmouth her to director David E. Talbert. Because you've not answered that question. That's a very simple question. I, I said to you earlier, Sydney, that that wouldn't be fair. I wouldn't think that that was fair. But what would you want That's to be done, answer. sir? How what would you want it fixed, Tyler? How would you want that fixed? And How would I want it fixed? Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. So that because I not and, and my husband is that part of our team that he has the business conversations. I'm the part of the team that you saw May 13th on the stage. So what I would ask you is because you're talking in Tyler Perry language. I would ask you to let Monique talk to Medea. Because when you start talking in Tyler Perry language, brother, you talk like you don't get it. Right, nigga. Right. You got to laugh at it because you know. Because you know. Because you know. See, let me tell you. Let me tell you, Tyler. When you, when I watch your movies, when I watch your movies, I dig my dear. And you know why I dig her? You know why I dig her, Tyler? Because she could be your mother. You know why I dig her? You know why I dig her? Because that bitch is real to her gut. And she don't give a fuck how I come out. She don't give a fuck how it's taken. But everybody knows she love you. But she going to tell you the real shit. See, when you stepped away from Medea and you became Tyler Perry the billionaire, this is the conversation you're having. Like, well, guys, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? See, you a brother that slept in your car. And you needed... And you needed niggas to fight for you to get you up out the goddamn car. See, your mama that you love so dearly. See, this is when I know that the, the, the powers that be and everybody saying on the radio and everybody saying on the media, oh, my God, it's Oprah and Tyler. They're the ones that can employ her. Why ever would she say it? Because I love them niggas. That's why I'm saying it. Because I'm tired of reading the stories 100 years from now where we had to go through this shit and we watch our brothers and sisters die and suffer in silence and in poverty and we know Know they was right. So what I'm saying to you is, Medea, make Tyler's ass step his ass up. I'm talking to Medea right now. Medea, I need you to pull Tyler's ass in the back and say, baby, you watching this sister and you watching her family starve. You're watching it. And you're saying, what do you want me to do? Listen, don't you play with that baby like that. You know the shit y'all did was wrong to her. You gave charity, you gave them four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars to charity, and you know that bitch got fifty thousand dollars. Where's my pistol, Brown? Where's my pistol? Cause I need to shoot this nigga. Now I'm not gonna kill him. I'ma shoot him in his ass to let him know Madea's mad as shit right now. <laughs> right. See, that's why I'm talking to my brother. So I appreciate you calling me. I do. I appreciate you calling us. But when you call me, what you gonna do? Well, let me, let me, let me say this. Let me say this. And I want to talk again. I'm going to write you a check, Monique. Seriously, because, no, no, hear me, hear me. Because this is the thing about this. And when we start talking about this, we're doing this, and this, we're doing that, and black people doing this, and black people doing that, what we need to understand about that is this. Where we are right now and what we're trying to do, we, we, we got some opportunities that a lot of most people didn't have. So what, what, I don't want you to feel one day, not one day, is that you were mistreated or that you were treated unfairly. Now, if that means that, that I, I, if that's what I need to do, then, then, then you, you do that. You do that. You take that and, you, and, 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 and take it from a place of love. Let me tell you where I'm going to take it from. Let me tell you where I'm going to take it from. 
I'm going to take it from its business. And I'm going to take it from my brother saying, listen, yo, this is what y'all was supposed to get. No, here's the thing, brother. Here's what we're saying is, when you say, I don't know what it's supposed to be, but I'm going to send you the check. Listen, not charity, brother. I don't, we don't, because see, what happens is, what's not going to take place on our watch is this. I wrote a check for something that came in, and it's one of those things where you're missing the point. And we believe enough in the universe to understand that, listen, when a person come to you sincerely with understanding what it is that you're talking about versus just saying, I'm going to find out what it is and I'm going to write a check. Now it's in the tabloids. You wrote us a check because, you know, I know you flew Whitney Houston in on your private jet. You know, you gave T.D. Jakes a million dollars. And the whole is, is the way that this is being done. It's like. Don't throw us no chump change because we had to go through a movie audit with Lee for monies that he didn't get. And they're saying that he did something with the money from the movie. Okay. These are the things that we had to deal with. So to speak about the dollars so that you're going to. That's the thing that I have to, I have to deal with too because I bought the movie to Lionsgate. Listen to what I'm saying though. This is, but listen, Tyler, 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 Tyler. This is what I need you to hear me. Hold on. In life, you can't walk around mad at everybody because one person did something to you. You must be able to compartmentalize where your frustrations lie. So when you say that you had the things going on with the movie and then you had it with Lee and then Monique, you're lumping everyone together. And that's what people of color have a tendency of happening to them. They get, they're all this way. See, if you just focus specifically on the interaction with Monique and yourself and I, it ain't never been anything but cordial, even in times of disagreement, because our thing is we not looking to, it's like we said on the podcast, who in the hell wrote the story about how David stepped to Goliath and said, let's roll dog. Let's me and you get down. Y'all are Goliaths. We just the Davids. We not in no position to be trying to start. We not looking to try to start any beef. But at the end of the day, all I'm asking you in your private time, because it's not going to happen right now on the phone. All I ask you in your private time is, how would you want to be treated if you were in a situation with people or a person put out something false about you, then you say, then someone said that they didn't have the same experience with you. They're glad that they had a great experience See, with. This is, this, is why, this is why I have trouble answering that question because it starts as a question and it goes in that direction. So what the I was on to you for a minute. Let, 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 me, let me stay with the question because you make a good point. Let me stay with the question. The question is, what would you want someone to do for you? who said things about you and or mentioned things about you, alluding to the difficulties that they had with you, all because you chose. Okay, okay, okay. I'm not finished. I'm not finished. All because you chose. How can you answer something and I'm not finished? Okay, well, let me answer part of the question. Maybe you can the other part. How about that? Can you do me a favor? Can you, since you called up to have a real conversation, Typically, I, I know you used the directing, but what I need you to do is just hear me out man to man. And that is this. How would you feel if someone says something about you that was, that you were not contractually obligated to do? What would you want them to do to make that right? And it don't have nothing to do with money. If somebody had said that, let's, let me just try to be in the position. If somebody had come along and said, Tyler's this terrible to work with. He's not going to do anything that you want him to do. He's, he's, he, he is, if they said all those things, right? If that's what the rumor was, and 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 there were other people who knew that was not was not to be true, I would want those people to stand up and say that's not true. So, will you and Oprah do that? I can't speak for Oprah. I can't speak for. Oprah. Will you do that? Is my experience. I, I, I certainly can. I, I I've never worked with Monique. All I can speak for. 
hurt my experience on pressure. I don't give a damn about saying saying that that. That would you do what you wanted done for you, Tyler? It's real simple. Would you do what you would want done for you? Because you at, you told David when he said his experience was wonderful, you said that was not your experience. And the question I would have, what did you experience with Monique and or I that made your uh, your interaction with us displeasurable, especially... But but Tyler, but, but Tyler, handle, man, but Tyler, this is where we are, though. I'm talking in real time. But when you understand, because you're again speaking about other entities and components besides Monique, what we're saying is what what made it this play? But experience. but what I'm saying to you is. I want your experience based upon your understanding that Monique, as we told you then, see, writing those scripts Come or on. whoever wrote those scripts, they understand life. Come on. And I thought it was you. Come on. And if you don't understand that when you sit by and you say nothing, when you know it's wrong, as you now said, you know, and you agree, then what's the what, what is the call really for, my brother? What is it? And I'm going to say this because I spent way too much time here. I thought that this would be a quick call that I could just call and say how I felt and, and to absolutely wish you the best. The but only see, way this changes, I think the only way, the only way this changes, I think, for, for you guys and where you are is this. I think Monique needs an amazing movie. She needs a, she needs to be with a, a great director. And once the movie's done, it comes out, she gets all this kind of buzz. She gets all this, this that she did before. And then this thing goes away. That's that's the way this changes. It's got to be the right thing that comes along. Kind of some of the stuff that I think Spencer has been doing that comes to or, or Viola comes along. She does that, and all of this goes away. You know, I know that, that, that town and how it works. It's like okay, oh that was a moment that's past. She's amazing. That was wrong. So what you, what you're asking me to do right now? First of all, I'm not going to get into this right now because because it's ugly and it's nasty. And, and it, it came from a comedy skit. I don't want. I don't want to be a part of. What What is ugly and nasty, Tyler, about saying? Because we're not talking about the comedy skit. You're obviously not hearing what I'm saying. No, 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 no. Here's the thing. You said you don't want any chump change. Does that mean you do not want the money for pressure or what? Wait, 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 Cause see now what happens is the billionaire starting to come out. Right. Now what's happening is when you call and say I didn't mean for this to take this long, brother, you called us. us. And see what that said was when when we first got the call. I'm gonna tell you some real stuff. My heart skipped a beat because I said, okay, we can ready to talk to a real cat because he reached out. But now the tone you're beginning to take is. I'm a billionaire, and I ain't got time for this, and it ain't going the way I thought it should. Wait, hold up, brother. Hold up. Hold up, because, see, you'll start over-talking. I ain't got time for this, and let me say this. And when you say chump change, here's the thing, baby. See, the community is involved right now. You know it, and I know it, and everybody out there know it. The community is involved, and they want to see how it's going to play out because the community is saying, wait a minute, y'all. Hold up. We don't know this sister to be no bullshitter. We know she a loud mouth. We know she is say some shit off the wall. But what we know about it is she true to a word. And all I would ask you is one, que two questions. The first question is, did you not just say it was wrong? Tyler. Did you not just say it was wrong, Tyler? To say she was difficult? For not doing something that she was not contractually obligated to do? Did you not say that you would feel that that was wrong? Or, or am I missing something? I, 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 I absolutely said that, yes. So the question I would say is... So the question I would say is... But, I didn't mean to spend this much time on it. Is because just like you were there with, with your beautiful twins, 
I got a little boy, and 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 I want to make sure when I'm off, that's where my attention. Is. Here's the so thing: then you should you, you shouldn't have made the call yeah. until you shouldn't have made the call yeah. until okay. you were able to talk. But the last question I would ask you. Hold, now, hold up. The, the, last, the last thing I want to ask you is this. It's real simple. If you said it was wrong, when do you speak up and say that it was wrong, Tyler? That's it. Okay, then that means telling my whole experience, which about how I feel about the whole thing. That means telling my whole experience. Whatever you... Listen, 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 but, 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 but Tyler... The whole Tyler, Tyler, here's the thing. You are articulate. You is smart. Okay. <laughs> and you is kind. And you and is you kind. Is <laughs> okay. Uh, listen to me. Listen, listen to me. Listen. Shit, this ain't the billionaire. This is me. Okay. Listen, 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 listen. Cut all that out. This is me talking to y'all. Then okay. please talk to us, brother. Talk, talk to us real then, because right. all I'm saying to you is that. I, I, I listen to me. I told you how I think that this changes. But did Monique throw shade in her Oscar speech? It was on March 7, 2010 that Monique showed up to the 82nd Academy Awards wearing a royal blue evening gown as the late comedian Robin Williams announced her as the winner for Best Actress in a Supporting Role. Everyone in attendance rose to their feet to give her a standing ovation. However, the opening line of her acceptance speech rubbed many people the wrong way when she thanked the Academy for showing that it can be about the performance and not the politics, many were taken aback. Winning an Oscar, being at the top of her career, it would appear that Monique was headed for greatness. Surely the floodgates were open with many a film pouring out for Monique to choose from. But many say that this was the beginning of the end for Monique, winning that Oscar and that acceptance speech. Everyone was at the edge of their seats just waiting for another stellar performance from Monique, another huge role, a television show, something. But it was quiet. Had Hollywood stopped calling? Monique told The Hollywood Reporter that she was offered the role in Lee Daniels' film The Butler, the role that Oprah Winfrey played. And she even received an offer to appear on another Lee Daniels project, the show Empire. Lee Daniels also reportedly offered Monique the role as Richard Pryor's grandmother in a biopic that he was chosen to direct. But following her Oscar win, Monique claimed each of those things that he offered me was just taken off the table. They all just went away. But Monique says, I guess that was show business, right? Netflix. Now, in 2018, Monique accused Netflix of racial and gender bias against her after she was paid $500,000 for her comedy special to air on the streaming service and called for a boycott. After her Netflix boycott failed to gain traction, she filed a discrimination lawsuit in November of 2019, claiming that the company failed to offer her more money because she was a black woman. The lawsuit states... The terms of Netflix offered to Monique were discriminatory based on her gender and race slash color, while alleging that the offer tried to perpetuate the drastic pay gap that black women experience. In addition to claiming that Netflix refused to negotiate with Monique's team, the lawsuit also accused the company of lacking diversity. Netflix has maintained a corporate culture, reaching the highest levels of senior leadership that has been insensitive to black workers. Relatedly, the company has been plagued by a lack of racial diversity within senior leadership, as well as across the organization. Monique's lawsuit continued saying, in short, as this lawsuit shows, Netflix treatment of Monique began with a discriminatory lowball offer and ended with a blacklisting act of retaliation. She compared herself to Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, Kevin Hart, and Amy Schumer, who each received multi-million dollar deals. In her statement, she stated, When we asked Netflix to explain the difference, why the money was so different, they said, Well, we believe that's what Monique will bring. We said to Netflix, Well, what about my resume? They said, We don't go off resumes. Then we asked them, What was it about Amy Schumer? And they said, Well, she sold out Madison square garden twice and she had a big movie offer in the summer is that not amy schumer's resume and then netflix said 
By the way, we believe Monique is a legend too. Why shouldn't I get what the legends are getting? Netflix legal team hit back hard on Monique the following January, calling her discrimination suit nonsensical and claiming she failed to explain why she was entitled to be offered what the stars to whom she compared herself were offered for creating such comedy specials. The streaming giant filed a motion to dismiss Monique's claim. Monique's discrimination lawsuit against Netflix was dismissed in March of 2020. A California federal judge dismissed the lawsuit, concluding that Monique had not adequately shown that Netflix's refusal to change their offer after she publicly blasted the deal amounted to retaliation. However, the judge gave Monique a chance to change her claims. The court's decision said, the court notes that the plaintiff raises a novel theory here, namely that failure to negotiate constitute an adverse employment action for purposes of retaliation claim. In light of the arguments that plaintiff raised orally before the court, the court allows the plaintiff to leave to amend her retaliation claims and to file a first amended complaint adding facts in support thereof. Netflix efforts to strike portions of Monique's lawsuit were partially granted and partially denied. The judge didn't strike down the part of the lawsuit that mentioned a pay disparity for a black woman and a part that mentioned a Netflix executive getting fired for using a racial slur in a meeting. He did strike down a portion of Monique's lawsuit that mentioned Kevin Spacey's alleged racism on the House of Cards set. Monique's lawsuit against Netflix is currently still being fought in the court system. Now, Monique pushing for more and more money is reportedly a common theme in her business dealings. Well, through all of this, Monique says that no one had her back. She appeared on this. Monique went on The View to discuss the Netflix boycott, and she wasn't exactly met with praises from Whoopi Goldberg. Whoopi told her, I said if you had called me, I could have schooled you on what was expected. Now, Monique did not like Whoopi's response at all, and she told a media outlet, when you have a woman saying, I could have schooled you, someone would say, what was the schooling going to be? When I look at this woman, you say is our icon and our legend, she is. But how many things has Whoopi Goldberg executive produced? Whoopi Goldberg has always been the help, and I say that humbly. So what is that that you're going to school me on? I've been doing it for almost 30 years. This is a woman who says, I could have schooled you. And this is a woman who accepted Ted Danson in blackface. And our community praises this woman. So oftentimes we do it to ourselves, but I just can't. Understand, I love you, my sister. However, when you know you're being fed the wrong food, you must say, I can't chew this, y'all. Now, Monique also says that she and Whoopi had a frank conversation after the show in Whoopi's dressing room, where Monique told Whoopi her intentions were to help other upcoming talents in Hollywood, but Whoopi disagreed. And Monique says, in that moment, I knew I was looking at a woman who didn't give a damn about me. And if she's telling me, stop worrying about that little girl who not here yet, well, she forgot about the ones that came before her who were worried about her. Because see, Whoopi Goldberg told me the salary she makes from The View. And that hurt my feelings. That you've been there for 10 years and you accept them paying you that. And you telling me, don't worry about the little one coming up. God damn if I ain't got to be worried about you too. Because you accept that salary, it makes it hard. What I think is also interesting, you mentioning um, Oprah. It seemed like definitely a disappointment to see someone that you looked up to. The character didn't match your character of how what you felt was also important. And I think about Whoopi Goldberg, you being a black woman, stand-up comedian, and you going to her show. And from what I um, kind of gathered, she brought up the whole Netflix thing, and you guys talked about black being blackballed on The View. And backstage, she tells you something in the regards of uh, don't worry about the other ones coming behind you worry about yourself how did you feel initially seeing someone that I'm assuming you looked up to pretty much tell you that they didn't care about you in a, in a sense see this is the part that's hard for me because there was some women 
that gave a damn about me before I got here. And that was Hattie McDaniels. That was Eartha Kitt. That was Ida B. Wells. That was Louise Beavers. That was those black women saying, I'm going to take these ass whippings so hopefully you won't have to take them. I'm going to take them calling me a to my face. I'll take them calling me a black I'll take them telling me, you better not step over this line. I'll take all of that so hopefully you won't have to. Patty LaBelle hugs me in a way, baby, that that hug came from a place of love. That's Aunt Patty in the community. And when I first met that woman, she held on to me so tight. And I was one of the last people in line of hundreds of people that stood in line at a concert. And she hugged me like I was the first. So I hold on to those memories to make me say, let me make sure that when a little girl holds on to me, she feels the same way I felt when Patti LaBelle held on to me at a concert after hugging people for two hours. You hear me? Two hours. Wow. And she hugged me like I was the first person in line. So when ain't no cameras rolling, Patti LaBelle is Patti LaBelle. See, when I first met Patti LaBelle, I was going through my second divorce, right? And I found out what I had to pay. So I'm backstage, baby, drama, drama, going through it. That woman pulled me to the side and said, come here, little girl, what's wrong with you? Don't you ever let them see you fall apart. The one thing that man can take from you is your talent. Give him that money right now, give it to him. And you go out on that stage and you show your ass. And you give the people in the back seat a hell of a show. Because they're the ones that really didn't have no money that's coming to see you. See, that's the kind I got. That's what I got filled with. I got filled with Valerie Simpson and Ashlyn Simpson inviting me up to their home and saying, Hey, baby, let me tell you what it's supposed to be. When one get it, everybody get it. That's the era we came from. So I got those women filling me. I got Susan Taylor from Essence saying, Listen. Don't bullshit it. When she walked away, Essence walked away. But when I got those women that pulling me up saying, hey, little sister, let me talk to you for a minute. So when I get Whoopi Goldberg on the flip saying, them little ones coming behind you. You better give a damn about you. That crushed me that day in her dressing room because see, Whoopi Goldberg told me the salary she makes from The View. And that hurt my feelings that you've been there for 10 years and you accept them paying you that and you telling me, don't worry about the little one coming up. God damn if I ain't got to be worried about you too because you accept that salary. It makes it hard for me. And how hard do you think it's going to make for the one who ain't here yet because you accept that salary? So the Stand in my sister's dressing room. And she say to me, you can't be worried about that one coming up. Well, what if moms Mabley didn't worry about you? What if those ones didn't make it better for us? So I try not to take it personal, but it's personal. Because these are the women I look to. So I don't want the little girl who's not here yet, or a little girl right down the street at the juice bar that says, oh my goodness, that's Monique. I don't want her to walk away and say, that ain't who I thought she was. Cheryl Underwood. Now in a Sway in the Morning interview, Monique claimed that Cheryl Underwood told her to take low offers. Cheryl then quickly responded on the talk saying, I do not recollect ever asking her to take less money, especially if she felt she was violated. What I asked her to do and what I was hoping that she would do was talk to Oprah Winfrey, Tyler Perry, and Lee Daniels. Now, she may not agree with me, but what I do commend her for now is having the discussion that will hopefully open the door to solving this racial and gender inequity problem that we see. Monique then clapped back in a podcast rant saying, I watched my sister Cheryl Underwood sit on that stage on the talk and she said, let me be clear about something. I never told Monique to take low offers. I told Monique if she asked for forgiveness from Oprah, Lee Daniels, and Tyler Perry, then things would be okay. Cheryl Underwood is telling a lie. I can't call my sister a liar, but what I will say is she's lying. I have the proof of the conversation. Will Packer. Now, during that same sway in the morning show, Monique revealed that the lead actors of the movie Almost Christmas were paid less than $1 million combined to appear on the film. 
she called out Will Packer, who was a producer on the film. Monique claimed that she, along with her husband, met with Will, and that man looks in our eyes and he says, I would like to offer you a three-picture deal and a sitcom, but I need you to do me this solid first. That's why I did it, Monique says. She described Will as a black producer who walked her up to a slave ship. However, John Murray reported that Will tried to work with Monique, but she and her husband were extremely demanding. John even claims that Will alleges Monique's husband tried to swindle more money out of the studio producer. Charlemagne the God. In February 2018, Monique appeared on The Breakfast Club to defend her Netflix boycott. She was on the show for about 40 minutes and the interview was extremely tense with Monique upset that Charlemagne labeled her the donkey of the day. After the interview, Monique compared him to a slave master who allows his wife to be raped by the master. Sister good morning, Monique. good morning, good morning, my love. Good morning, how you doing, sister? Let's start with love, let's start with love. Good baby, good morning. I'm good. wonderful. I am wonderful. How you doing, sister I'm Angela? Good. You? You're good. It's okay. all right to get on up and hold on to me. Good morning, sweetness. <laughs> DJ Envy over baby. there. Good oh, morning. my sweetness. I will get around to you, but it's, it's all right. crowded. All right. One hour later. Eddie, thank you so much, my sweet baby, for having us. Why do you keep thinking them? You know me. You know what, brother? You're going to hear yourself a lot from me lately. You're going to hear yourself around the world because we have to explain brothers like you. We do. And when we watched that movie, Birth of a Nation, and we saw that man walk his wife into that master's house, we watched him walk his wife in. Then we watched him go back and get him. You're that brother. I thank y'all for your time, you. my babies. Thank you. Roland Martin. On Friday, January 26, 2018, Roland Martin tweeted at Democracy NC. Love what y'all do. Keep pushing for democracy in North Carolina. Monique then questioned Roland's activism. Roland immediately and respectfully responded. He even called out Monique's husband, Daddy, saying, Monique, the fact that you're even asking the question about what I have done to fight for equality and sisters shows you don't know. I don't talk about it. I do it. Have done it my whole career. I don't need to talk. I put in the work. I sat with you on TV One TV where I discussed the issue with you and Lee Daniels and Precious. I listened and heard you out. So why all the drama with Almost Christmas where you were brilliant? You should have gotten lots of roles after that. Ask yourself why you didn't. Is it you and your husband or is it Lee Daniels, Oprah, Tyler Perry, Will Packer, David E. Talbert, and others that are the problem? Your talent is immense, but life ain't just about who has talent. It's also how we treat everyone else. That's also equality. Child. Kim Whitley. Kim Whitley was asked about Monique blasting Tyler Perry, Oprah, and Lee Daniels on the reel back in May of 2019. Kim was fair towards Monique, saying that comedians expressed their frustrations on stage, so she understood Monique's anger. She also joked that Monique was starting to sound like the old auntie at a table. Well, instead of Monique laughing that comment off, not taking it so serious, Monique responded by exposing her and Kim's friendship. In a 13 minute rant, she revealed private conversations and even accused Kim of flirting with her husband, Sydney. When I first got to Hollywood, first got to Parker's, and we went out for lunch, and her name was Vivica Frank. She said, check this out. You better get you some bitches that can roll like you can roll, because you'll find yourself always paying for the bitches, because everybody's gonna look to you like, you the bitch with the money. She said, so find you some sisters that can roll like you roll. Well, I appreciated that. So I found me some sisters that can roll like I roll. Though I didn't drop off my, my friends that I knew were my friends, I will say this, there was a time that they could have dropped me off because I got to a place called Hollywood and I was like, oh, I'm, 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 I'm out here now. So I wasn't always the greatest friend to my friends. Sydney can attest to that, Michelle can attest to that, Robin can attest to that, but these are people that are truly my friends because through it all, we're still together. So I'm saying all that to say this. When I watched The Real, and I had to watch it for myself, I didn't want anybody saying, I heard, 
because I don't play the I heard, it's unfair, because that's when stories can get mixed up and confused. So I had to watch it for myself because the first time I saw the clip, I only saw the clip with our baby, uh, what's her name, a a a what, what's the baby name? Adrian. I only saw that clip. And when I responded to the clip, I responded the way I still respond. That baby gets a pass because she's too young to even begin to understand what the fight is for. So I understand her making the comment. It's like, listen, y'all, I'm on TV. I want to secure my place. I want to let people know I have a voice. So here it goes. So with that baby, she does get a pass. She gets a pass. However, the producer did call from the real. I'm sorry, I sent an email mm -hmm. saying that whenever we would like to come on, we're more than welcome. They're down for hiatus, but they go back up in September, and we're more than welcome to come on. And we're going to take them up on that. So someone else called me and said, yo, did you hear Kim Whitley? And I was like, no. And they were pretty pissed off because it's somebody that knows both of us. And it was like, yo, I'm, I'm kind of fucked up because she was talking greasy about you. And I was like, Kim Whitley? So he said, you got to go watch the clip. So I watched this clip. And I watched Kim Whitley when they asked her, what do you feel about what Monique said? And she says, she's like the fourth supreme. And she's like that aunt that just won't let it go. Now I'm watching this sister say it on her mind, right? And I, I said, okay, this is a person that we've had a friendship. This is a sister that we've gone to both of those homes. We've broken bread together. This is a sister, and when I watched her, and then she said, well, what I know about Oprah, everything is always good intentions. For the three or four years I've been on her network, she always operates from love. Okay, but I'm watching you be shitty. And that's the best word I can give, shitty. <laughs> shitty. I don't want to say messy, fuck it. It was shitty. Okay, so I'm watching your sister be shitty. And I'm saying to myself, are you trying to secure a position on the wheel? Because the sister you're speaking about that's the fourth supreme, the sister that you're speaking about that needs to let shit go, I'm the same sister that you called up and wanted advice from me and my husband because you were being mistreated by your representation. And they wanted you to go into a meeting with a woman who happened to be white, who had never been on TV before, but they wanted you to go in there and sell yourself to this woman. So it was me in Sydney that Kim called up and said, y'all, this ain't right. And I said, no, it's not right, sister. And when you go into that meeting, you have to ask that woman, what are you bringing to the table? Because you know my resume. We're those people. I'm the same sister. And see, I think these conversations are important because a lot of us want to get to Hollywood. A lot of us want to go, but sometimes, baby, you don't know what you're really walking into because no one had these conversations with me. Kim Whitley is the same sister that we would go on walks in the mountains. And this wasn't one walk, two walk. This was something we did. And this is a sister that when we would go on those walks, she would cry on my shoulder and we would cry together just talking about life. This is the same sister that said to me, as we got to the top of the mountain one day with tears coming down her eyes, Monique, you have everything. And I said, Kim, I don't have everything. I'm just happy with what I had. But I don't have everything. There's some shit with me that you know about. But, so let's not do that when you're feeling like I have everything, because I don't. I'm that sister, Kim Whitley. I'm the sister that you called the night that Joshua was mother had him in the hospital. I'm her. And you said, Monique, she don't want to take this baby home. I don't know what to do. And I said, Kim, that baby could change your life. That baby could make a big difference. Now, I don't know if she called Oprah that night. I don't know how many long walks her and sister Oprah been on. I don't know how many times she's had to call Oprah up and say, hey, I need some advice because they're treating me wrong. I don't know. But what I will say is this. It is disheartening. When you do watch someone sit on international television all over the world that you actually had in your home, 
You've been in her home. Y'all have had intimate, real conversations. And you say, was this you trying to get a spot? Or is this how you really feel, sister? Because now you start questioning, what were those walks? Were those walks genuine? Or were those walks, bitch, you the it girl right now. And you the bitch I want to be seen with. I'm the same girl. When you say let it go, and when you say she the auntie that holds on to shit, I'm the same one. That on the day of the Oscars, Al Roker, right, wanted to come do an interview with me. We want to see what your day looks like the day of the Oscars. I said, okay, baby, I'll start out with a walk. Me and Ken Whitley, we walk, we climb the mountain. And those producers said, no, 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 no. We just wanted to be you and Al. And I said, no, 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 no. Y'all caught me out. Y'all want to come and see what I'm doing. This is what I do. Me and my sister, we go, we go for our work. When the production crew got there, they still tried to push Kim Whitley out. I said, guys, I told y'all when you called, this is what me and my sister do. So if you want to talk, I ain't got no problem with it. But she ain't going nowhere. I'm the same sister that when we went for a walk and we were with Valerie Goodlove. She's a legend, iconic journalist, writes for Jack, you know, powerful sister, beautiful sister. When we go for our walk and we're talking about the whole campaign and everything, and Kim Whitley was saying, I understand what you're saying and you're right. So it's... When I say friends, how many of us had them? For me, the lesson that I'm learning is I've got to be more careful. And I don't want to stop being vulnerable, Daddy. I don't want to, when I say vulnerable, I don't want to become that person that I got to shut it down because you might not be good or you might not be good or you might have another motive. Because what I will say is Kim Whitley knows what her life is because I know what it is. And never will I say any thing mean about my sister. Though we don't have a friendship, she's still my sister. And I would not intentionally say anything that I thought would put my sister in a bad way. Still won't do it. But what I will say is we got to pay attention to the word friend because it's been thrown around so much recently with me. I've heard people, I'm your friend, that's my friend, that's my friend. And in dealing with Kim Whitley, and I have to have the conversation, and I know people are saying, oh, God, Monique, why? Because some of us go to our graves, y'all. And we go to our graves in pain. We go to our graves suffering. We go to our graves with things that have been put on our name that's never been cleared up. And we're afraid to stand up. And when I see my sister sit on that show and talk about what she knows about Oprah's intentions, Kim, you remember our conversations that we had about Oprah Winfrey. So when you open up that can of worms and when you get on a stage and now you gotta, I gotta be I'm on her network, so I gotta, she shows love. But that one right there gotta be careful. Monique and Sydney. We're the people, Kim, that when you came to our home and you had Joshua and you said, girl, I think he got eczema. And I said, bitch, have you put some moisturizer on him? And she said, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do? Yeah. We're the same people. So when I see women that has shared intimate moments with me and my family, you've been in my space. I've been in your space. And someone put, oh, they were just jokes. No, that's not just a joke. Because Kim Whitley and I know where we sit with one another. She knows that. And when you now have to say it publicly, let me explain why I feel the way I feel. And then I saw a meme that she put out there, the one with our sister Whitney, when she was like, girl, go ahead with that. Just her hand gestures. And I'm like, sister, I have empathy for you. And there was a time in my life that I would have called up, I'm coming over, and we could raise do this, bitch. There was a time in my life that I would have did that. But at this time in my life, 
what my husband is showing me, teaching me, nurturing me with is, Mama, you have to have empathy. And not, I'm not saying you got to sympathize, but you have to have empathy because there are times in your life, there are things you've done and said and you wish that, oh, okay, I fucked that one up, where you had to be shown empathy. So when y'all say to me, when I see in the comments, when I get the Twitter responses, when I get the Instagram responses, it's from a few. But when you say, why in the fuck is your husband always right there? My response would be, where's yours? Where's yours? See, Kim Whitley, I'm the same one you called up. Remember the day you called me up and you was like, girl, I got to tell you something, but I can hear the nervousness in your voice. And you said there was this fine ass man pulling up next to me in a convertible. And I didn't know it was Sydney. And I was trying to get myself together once I knew. Now, it. that has nothing to do with anything. It That's don't. just extra shit it to lay on shit. top of. But I'm going to tell you why. Because when it is that shit, daddy, you like, you going to sit up with bitch. Do you know me? This me and you. This me and you. This is me and you where I had to stop fooling with you for a little while. Because you didn't understand the definition of friendship. And at the time, I didn't have the patience nor the tech to deal with someone that I'm looking at you and I'm knowing you're doing some foul shit. So I didn't have to tap that. Until my husband said to me one day, Mom, y'all gotta have y'all are sisters in the game. And if it can be fixed, go on and work it out. I made the call. She says to Sydney personally, I'm so glad you got involved because Kim knew I was done. But he got involved and work us out and nurture our friendship for us to watch that. So for Kim Whitley, sister, the reason why we had to say it publicly, because you felt comfortable enough to talk publicly in a joke. But if ever you want to sit down for real, guess what we're going to be? Right here on Monique and Sydney's open relationship. Now we know about Monique's feelings of Oprah Winfrey exploiting her family drama for ratings and views. But in February, Monique took it up a notch blasting Oprah yet again by writing an open letter on Instagram to call out the perceived disparity in the way Oprah treats those around her. Monique wrote how she felt compelled to criticize how Oprah treats famous friends who were accused of the same crimes after Oprah said she found a silver lining in the Harvey Weinstein allegations during a CBS This Morning interview. In the letter, Monique also said, you also said if we were to make this all about Harvey Weinstein, then we have lost the moment. When you either are or were going to be part of a documentary on Michael Jackson and Russell Simmons, how is that not making it all about them? Monique also accused Oprah of racism over her going after Simmons instead of Weinstein. The only difference between the two is their skin color. And doesn't HW have way more accusers? Recalling a time when a 16-year-old Monique met and idolized Oprah, Monique added how she never imagined she would grow up in a world where the latter made her life harder. Monique concluded the letter by saying, Lastly, please consider standing by the people who are right and not just the right people. Oprah did not ever respond to that letter. Now, just when it seems like all hope is lost, we know that the universe always has a way of presenting an opportunity. And Monique's opportunity came from unlikely sources, Curtis 50 Cent Jackson and Lee Daniels. Monique had went on Fox Souls, turned out with T.S. Madison and did an interview with T.S. in which she discussed the situation regarding Lee Daniels, Oprah and Tyler Perry. The interview was well received by the public. T.S. then had Lee Daniels on her show in which she discussed with him the situation with Monique. Taking accountability for his actions, this led to a public reconciliation between Lee and Monique. On April Fool's Day at the Monique and Friends April Fool's Day with the Queen of Comedy show, Lee came out on the stage and publicly apologized to Monique. This is so goddamn real. This is so motherfucking real. I'm shaking, that's how it looks. 
you and I, along with some other amazing people, made magic. And I don't ever want us to lose that magic again. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, sometimes in life, you get caught up, you know? When you a nigga and you come from nothing, you get, you get blinded by some shit. And it took me a long time to realize. I am so sorry for hurting you in any way that I did. Y'all, that she was my best friend. My best friend. Y'all think that Precious was just, that wasn't, that was, that was God working through both of us. And we gonna fucking do it again. I love you. I love you. I love you. Staten Island. Now that Monique and Lee have patched things up, Monique is set to star in an upcoming Netflix thriller, Demon House, which will be directed by Lee Daniels. Monique is actually replacing Octavia Spencer, who was originally cast, but seemed to have had scheduling conflicts with Apple TV and a television show, Truth Be Told. So she's taking over. Monique is taking over that role. Now, apparently 50 Cent has been a fan of Monique ever since she accused Tyler Perry, Lee Daniels, and Oprah of allegedly blackballing her and he was in support of her call to boycott Netflix. Earlier this year 50 echoed Monique's sentiments and even called out Tyler and Oprah himself for their treatment of Monique saying I gotta get at the real mo worldwide back in pocket 50 wrote in an Instagram post we only supposed to cancel shit that ain't good for the culture we need you to win again now Monique I'm sure Oprah Winfrey and Tyler Perry would not want to continue to allow their influence to damage at the Real Mo Worldwide career, he wrote in a separate post. This has went on for way too long, so now would be a great time to apologize because I'm going to put her back on. Now keeping to his word, 50 casted Monique in the upcoming season of his BMF series. 50 posted a clip of Monique dressed as her character Goldie along with the caption that read, Guess who I got in BMF this season? Goldie, GLG, Green Light Gang. I don't miss the underdogs back on top at the Real Mo Worldwide. My name is Goldie. <laughs> you know who the fuck I am. Now Monique seemed to be back with her next opportunity being on the bill of the Comedy Explosion comedy show alongside other comedians with DL Hughley being one of them now on may 28 2022 the show was in detroit at the fox theater and as you can imagine it was a full house the energy was on 10. monique takes to the stage and begins by expressing her excitement and happiness at finally being back at the fox theater having not performed there for 20 years but things quickly take a turn for the worse Y'all don't understand the fight 
a bitch had to go through to stand in front of y'all tonight. Y'all don't understand I was ready to walk the fuck up out of here, but I said I can't let the people down of motherfucking Detroit, because the promoters as raggedy as a motherfucker. I don't fuck with nobody. I take pride in not fucking with nobody, nigga. But if you fuck with me, we gon' dance, nigga. We gon' do the two-step, nigga. Mm. See, I take pride, baby. In my whole motherfucking career, can't nobody tell you I ever started no shit with them. That ain't what the fuck I do. My heart would hurt if I tried to bully a motherfucker or start some shit with a motherfucker. But what niggas had to understand about me, I ain't for that Hollywood bullshit. If you cross the motherfucking line, Oprah, if you cross the motherfucking line, Tyler, I'm gonna see you cool, motherfucker. Come on, the cool train, nigga. Choo -choo! That niggas told me Monique, let go, and let go. <laughs> let go, and let go. They have taught niggas to be so motherfucking fearful and just give it to God. Let go and let go. So I kept, I, I kept hearing the shit over and over and over again. So I said, well, let me let the shit go, and let me give it to God. And you know what God did? He gave it right the fuck back. He said, bitch, I gave you everything you need to deal with these motherfucking cones. Steve Harvey. D.L. Hughley. I gave you everything you need to deal with these motherfucking coons. I don't fuck with nobody. See, tonight, I'm gonna tell y'all what the fuck is going on because y'all know one thing about me, bitch, I'm gonna tell. That's why they ain't like me as a little girl, bitch, because I'm a tell. Bitch, I'm gonna tell you out there kissing Petey on the playground, bitch. You nasty whore, we in the third grade, bitch. I'm going to tell. Yes, he pumped me, bitch, but nobody saw it. Oh, I'm a tell. See, I fucks with contracts. That's why niggas got a problem with me. If you sign the motherfucking contract, that's what the fuck it is. But they're so used to niggas fucking around with the contract and being nervous because they might lose an opportunity or a motherfucking chance. So they will redo the contract. I'm not a bitch who's gonna redo the contract. If you sign the motherfucker, that's what the motherfucker is. So tonight, see, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna break it down for you, Detroit, because I would feel less than a motherfucking woman if I didn't let y'all know what the fuck was going on on this stage right now. So if my energy is a little different, nigga, because they got me fucked up. The motherfucking contract said that a bitch is the headliner. The headliner. Let me say it again. The headliner. That's what the motherfucking contract says. Monique is to be the last motherfucking person on the goddamn stage. She is the headliner. That's what I signed the fuck up for. I'm 30 plus years in this motherfucking business and I don't open for no goddamn body. The contract said the headliner. The contract said the headliner. The contract said the headliner. But a nigga named D.O. Hughley turned into a bitch and said I won't perform if she does that. I won't go out if she does that. Nigga, you open for the kings of comedy. I close for the queens of comedy, nigga. And you think that I don't have a dick that ain't my position, nigga. So when I leave this motherfucker, the headliner has left. with nobody, sure. I don't fuck with no motherfucking body. But when you cross the line with me, nigga, you have crossed the motherfucking line. And that bitch, nigga, has crossed the motherfucking line. See, we got a history, nigga. We got a history. That nigga went on a tour talking about all Monique wasn't. You can Google it right now. D.L. Hughley on Monique, all I wasn't, what I wasn't worth, all of this bullshit. And nigga, you put your feet under my motherfucking table. So you came to my home, nigga. And you put your feet under my motherfucking table. I don't get down like that, goddammit. You got a bitch wrong. You talk about young thug and because of their names, nigga, your name is DL. What the fuck does it stand for? 
Hey, how far you bending over, nigga, on the DL? You fuck with the wrong one. That's my family, nigga. I'm home, nigga. I'm motherfucking home, yo. I go all the way back with Coco in the motherfucking lounge in the back of the bar when they was cooking motherfucking fried fish, bitch. That's me, nigga. That's me, Detroit. I'm the bitch who did fuck a nigga in the car, but bitch, that happened so long ago. See, black women, let me tell you something. A lot of black men in Hollywood got a problem with me. Cause I got a motherfucking black king. That's my husband. And them niggas can't understand it. They can't fathom it. It makes them motherfucking sick. Because at what time did black men start attacking black women? What kind of real nigga is that? That's a bitch nigga. That's a bitch nigga. What kind of real nigga would ever attack a goddamn black woman? A bitch nigga. I feel sorry for Dale Hughley's family. I feel sorry for his motherfucking wife. Cause how do you suck the dick of a coward? I tried to play fair, bitch. I tried to play fair, nigga. I tried to play fair. We was on the countdown, nigga. 10, 9, 8, 7, check. See? I don't fuck with nobody. And as an entertainer, families are off limits. As entertainers, we don't fuck with each other's families. Because for me, that is crossing the line. See, I want to give y'all a history so you understand a bitch's position. I want to give you the history, mama, so you understand. See, when I look at my wiser sisters and she look at me like this, get that, nigga. Thank you, mama. See, I did this radio show one time, right? Because I'm, I'm thinking, this is my boy. This, man, this nigga ain't never had no motherfucking problem, yo. So we on the radio show, and when we get to the end of the motherfucking program, bitch, did you hit program? <laughs> bitch, want the England program? When we get to the end of the program, oh, they say, Monique, would you like to play a game? Well, bitch, I like to play games. So I said, sure, let's play a game. And it's a game called Would You Rather. Would you rather? I said, fuck it, let's go. And then the sister Jasmine says, would you rather your husband fuck Lee Daniels without a condom or Corinne Steffens with one? I want y'all to hear the bitch shit this nigga that tried to put me through, y'all. Would you rather your husband fuck, like nigga, what kind of shit are you putting over the air to your motherfucking listeners? That's coon shit. So be careful who's feeding your motherfucking soul because you might swallow coon pie and you can't get the coon off of you and it'll give you goddamn diarrhea. I don't fuck with nobody, but don't fuck with me. Now let's start the motherfucking show. I feel better. Sometimes you got to say your shit. Sometimes you got to say your shit. What you say? Sometimes you got to say your shit. Sometimes you got to say your shit. Sometimes because they've taught niggas to be scared. They've taught niggas not to call out motherfuckers who's dead ass wrong. So y'all know that shit when it went down with Bill Cosby. Y'all know we was like. Mm -mm -mm. Now, what followed was a bunch of back and forth on the internet, on Instagram, with the two posting their contracts. Well, D.L. Hughley took to his radio show and further explained the situation. Talk, I work very hard to control the environment I work in comedically. I only work where I want to work and who I want to work for, I want to work with. I don't work, I, I, because that is a very precious place to me. I, I've been offered uh, a gig, uh, a couple of gigs, uh, three or four gigs, I, uh, uh, to work with Monique in LA, in Brooklyn, in uh, Houston, and I turned them down because I just, I, I didn't think it would work. Um, so, uh, after talking to a lot of people, uh, and uh, one of the very people in this room about
about how things are different. Uh, two of the very people in this room, as a matter of fact, and how things are different and look at, you know, how things are coming around. I decided it would be wrong for me not to give somebody a chance based on things that they'd never done to me. That was at her invitation. Uh, I, I was doing a gig in Greenbelt, Maryland. She lived in Baltimore. She was having a fight party. It was, uh, I think, Evander Holyfield and Mike Tyson. And sure enough, I came to her table at her invitation. And it was a wonderful time. As a matter of fact, it was based on that interaction, along with talking to people, I decided that I would do these gigs. I decided I would do it. And now I know what Tyler Perry knows. I know what Lee Daniels knows. I know what Oprah knows. I know what Steve Harvey knows. I know what Charlemagne the God knows. I know what Netflix knows. Saying yes to Monique is an occupational hazard. Now, come, we go to, uh, we're playing a gig in uh, Detroit this weekend. Um, I, 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 I know I'm going on at 9.45. I leave the hotel. I get there around 9. Monique had just gotten there. She was supposed to be there, uh, there at 8.40. She had just gotten there, gone at 8.40. She got there at 8.38. What Monique was trying to do was to slow walk the show. She didn't get, end up getting on for 30 minutes. The oldest trick in the world is if I want to change the order and I don't have merit, I'll try to make people wait so long that everybody gets nervous and go, please, just, just go on so we, we can avoid a conflict. That didn't happen. Monique got on stage. Monique actually felt like she had merit. She would have done one of three things. Either she would have took it up with the promoter, and she did, and the promoter said, we're going on, and whether you're going or not, that's a different thing. You would have not done it, but she knew she had to get on stage, or she would have been in breach of contract, or she would have come to talk to me. She didn't ever, and I and I, I emphatically emphasize this, she never once talked to me. I, I haven't seen Monique in years. I didn't see her at the venue before, after, or during. I haven't spoken or seen Monique. So if you really thought that you had a, a legitimate contract dispute, you would have come to me and said, hey, I have this contract and you had this contract. Notice not one thing on that contract, not one person she has on that contract, not one thing happened. Do you know why? Because it wasn't legitimate. And she goes on stage and she proceeds to eviscerate me. Not just me, but Steve Harvey, uh, the, the sexual, uh, my wife, my dog later on in subsequent conversations. Let me ask you something. What did any of that have to do with an alleged contract dispute? What does Steve Harvey have to do with your contract? What did I have to do with your contract? What did my dog have to do with your contract? What does my wife have to do with your contract? You wrote your contract, you and your daddy. You, 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 you proceeded to say things that were so patently insulting that, that you, it, it was galling. It was galling. You, 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 you ask in subsequent conversations why I have a dog, a support dog. What kind of person has a support dog? I have that dog because my father died my children and family decided they would get a dog from where he was from, and I named the dog after my father. I don't have a dog to keep people away from me. I have a dog, so I have my father with me all the time. That is an act of love which you know very little about. You proceeded to assault my sexuality. You have the temerity to assault someone's sexuality, a man's sexuality, given who you lay next to. None of that had anything to do with alleged contact contract dispute. You could have taken that up with a lawyer. You would have gotten out. You could have not gotten gone on stage, but you knew you didn't have a valid contract. And you do what you always have done. You tried to weaponize black femininity. You tried to turn that audience against me. You tried to burn everything down. Like you do all the time. Who calls Netflix and thinks I can get $10 million because I did the Queens of Comedy? Who thinks you can get on stage and still live off that? I was a king of comedy. You never hear me talking about it because in this business, like any other, it isn't what you have done, it's what you do. That that show was one I signed on to do. I made the quintessential mistake, the horrible mistake that like Tyler Perry, like Lee Daniels, like Oprah, like all these people of saying yes to you. And it is an occupational hazard. It is my fault. I have learned my lesson. You didn't just, and the thing that bothers me the most isn't the things that you said, because I know who I am and I know what I do. And I have a pristine reputation. And everybody who knows me know what, I, what, what I'm about. It's this whole, my dear, my babies, I love you for real, which is so transparently false, it is ridiculous. But the thing that, that was really the most annoying, the thing that was really the most bothersome is after a, a, a terrible couple of weeks where people were being slain in Buffalo, where people were being slain, kids were getting slain in school, and people had come to a comedy show to get away from all of their problems, you besieged them with yours. The one contract that isn't in dispute is the one that the audience had with us to entertain them. But every single time, more and more, you spend half of your time talking about your grievances and what you didn't get and who did this to you. 
Listen, when you burn things up and you sit back to watch the results of them, she's literally set that stage on fire, said the most incendiary things ever, and I had to go on stage. She has the temerity to call me a coward. A coward would have left. A coward would have said, I can't go. You didn't even want to go on when you had a, a contract that you knew that not to be true. You made up this whole narrative that you knew not to be true, and you played that out in front of the audience. And then I had to go on behind you. And you know what you did? You sat back and you tried to watch your damage. You set the stage on fire and you watched what you've done. You know who does that? Arsonists do that. Arsonists set shit on fire and try to see the damage it drops. But I, I blame myself because I know now that what I didn't before. Saying yes to you is an occupational hazard. One I will not repeat. I don't blame you. I wish you well. But when you do the things you do, when everything's about you, when you're vitriolic, when you have all these fights with all of these entities, it is you. Precious was not a movie. Precious was an autobiography. That is who you are, literally. You, you're mad at the contract you and daddy wrote? Your daddy? And I don't know why you call a man daddy and you pay for him. That's a son. Let's be clear. I'm not angry with you. I'm angry with you. So what has followed has been a bunch of back and forth between D.L. Hughley and Monique and her husband on social media. Now, some are asking, why is Monique allowing her husband to be her manager? Some are saying that she needs to get rid of Sydney and replace him with a reputable manager. Even Whoopi Goldberg has said the same thing. Entities have set back and they let a lie brew and they let it build and build and build and said absolutely nothing. So when Sister Whoopi says to me on the show, you should have called me because I could have schooled you. Now Whoopi and I had a conversation before I went to The View. And I was very appreciative of Sister Whoopi for setting that up because I called her at home and I said, hey Whoopi, you got a minute? She said, give it to me. And I let her know what was going on. Within two days, we get a call from the producer from The View. Mm -hmm. Let's get it set up. I appreciate our sister for that. But the conversation Whoopi and I had before I got to The View, when Whoopi said to me, if you would have called me, I would have told you, you go to Con and you tell them to bring your family over there and it could be a family vacation and I would have told you, you go over there and you let those people see you. And I said, Whoopi, and I would have said to you, at what point do we have to say no? At what point do we have to say no? Because what you're saying to me is what's been said to me throughout my whole career. Let's keep our fingers crossed and hope for the next one. Let's hope for the next one. And if you get over here and they really like you, they might give you a chance. So this is a conversation that my sister and I had off camera, but I'm sure she's, she's not offended that we're having it publicly because she's that kind of woman. Well, she says what she means. So when we had that conversation before I even got to The View, I was very clear about my position. And she was very clear about her position. And neither one of us was wavering from our positions. So when she said on The View, I would have schooled you. When we got off camera and Whoopi Goldberg and I went up into her dressing room and she did not have to do this, y'all. This is why when I say she's a beautiful sister, and people said they, they clashed. We didn't clash. We just agreed to disagree. Because when we got to her dressing room and we were sitting down and this is what she said to me. She said, listen. I don't get involved in this intervention shit. That ain't what I do. She said, but from the first time I saw you, I loved you. So I'm going to tell you right now, you've got to take some of this responsibility. And the real problem is, Monique, it, you're being ill-advised, <clears throat> ill-advised. You're not thinking for yourself. And the whole, the real problem is your husband. At that point, I had to grab Whoopi Goldberg's hands as we were sitting across the table from one another. And I said, sister, let me tell you about my husband because you're misinformed and you're making statements that you really don't know what you're talking about. But let me fill you in when you say it's my husband. I said, see, I've had the big white manager. I've had the big white agent. I've had the big attorney firm all in Hollywood. And every one of them that I had when I would walk into those meetings, I would watch those people cheat me. I would watch them cheat me. And I would watch them, and they would say to me, we'll get him the next time, Monique. We'll get him the next time, Monique. I said, Whoopi, the reason why my husband is considered to be a problem is because when we're in those meetings with those executives, they can't answer his questions. 
And what normally happens is when they have questions, when we get into those meetings, there are normally no, no questions ever asked. It is whatever you offer us, that is what we accept, and you're supposed to keep on going. I said, that is why they are having a problem with my husband. I said, so when you say to me, that's the real problem, and I, I would never say this to anybody, I appreciate what you're saying to me because there was a woman that was talking to me out of love and out of fear. And I said to Whoopi Goldberg in her dressing room for some of the things she was sharing with me, which I will never share publicly because she shared it with me. But I said to her, what you're sharing with me makes me have to fight even harder. Because if not, the baby coming up behind us, she's going to have the same story that me and you're having. I said, Whoopi, how come we can't sit back like Roseanne Barr can? How come we can't sit back like Rosie O'Donnell? How come we can't sit back like Ellen DeGeneres? How come we can't sit back like our white women counterparts? How come we're not given the same opportunities and the same paydays? And when I look at my sister, and she looks back at me, and she says, I need you to let it go and just move on. And I said, Whoopi, because we keep letting it go is why they keep fucking over us. So I can't let it go. We've moved on. That's just life. You've got to move on. But you can't let it go when you've been bullied. And when I get faced with, it's her husband, it's her husband. I want to tell y'all something about my husband. Nada made me take my glasses off, Daddy. Okay. I want to tell y'all something about him because I'm getting a little tired of hearing, especially the black women that's in the business, that want to tell me about my husband. And when I have black women telling me about my husband that's in the business, but then I say, who is your husband? I don't have one. Oh, who are you in a relationship with? I don't have one. But you're taking out the time to tell me all that my husband's not doing. See, my husband being my manager, it was a position that he did not ask for. And he kept saying, Mama, that's not what I want to do. And I said, Daddy, I'm going to need you to do this. And then we had a meeting with the guy that was my manager at the time. And this white man said to me, listen. Our job is not to be in a relationship with you. The talent is never our best interest. Our best interest has to be with the studios and the networks because, Monique, people like you, y'all come and go. So we have to have the relationships with Hollywood. That day he lost his job as my manager. That day. And that's when I had to look to my husband and he said, you don't have to say no more. So when people are beginning to question me about my husband, especially women that look like me, see, I don't know how many of your managers... When you hosted, your, hosted the BET Awards, I don't know how many of your managers wrote that show for you. See, my husband, he wrote that. Every word y'all heard me say on that stage that night, my husband wrote that. But I don't know how many of y'all managers do that. See, when my husband goes into those meetings with those executives, and what he says is, in a very gentleman way, I can't allow y'all to cheat her. See, the same thing Viola is saying is the same thing I'm saying. It's no different. It's no different. So when y'all want to question... What am I doing with my husband, who is also my manager? It, it saddens me that so many of our black women are brainwashed to believe your man can't do it. And when you ask, what are my credentials to manage? My credentials to manage are simply utilizing common sense. See, since I was 19, I was closing deals for folks that were four figures. And I was closing deals for people in their 40s and 50s at the age of 19. And now I know what it is to close from a four-figure deal to an eight-figure deal. Now, there's... Uh, people that have done way more than I, but a little young black guy from Baltimore, Maryland, mm. closing seven and eight figure deals, that's my credentials right there. That's my resume. And I say it with the utmost humility because at the end of the day, I'm not connected to the world that uh, the Caucasians may be connected to. I'm not impressed by anyone because of your color, because of your cash flow. And if you are not comfortable with being respectful to someone named Monique who has earned it, I am very comfortable saying to you, we respectfully decline your most gracious offer. Because I'm not in a position, nor am I worthy, of being the person who is going to impose what I want to do over someone who has had a 30-year career. What my job is to do is execute what it is that she asked me to do. And you'll have to forgive me for not being the person and the man who, when my wife says, and my client, in quotes, mm. says, hey, I don't want to go 
out here and work and fly internationally and leave my family and I'm not contractually obligated to do so because if I was to ask Lionsgate for a dime and offer them nothing the world would look at me as if I'm crazy so when they call when Tyler calls when uh, Oprah calls I'm going to choose my family over fame because they were not offering any finances and as opposed to me being the, the type of man who says to my wife and my client hey listen don't you know how powerful they are come on don't you know if you don't go that they will hurt us and they will affect us what I said was you know what I understand because the woman from Lionsgate wanted to uh, make me aware that well Halle Berry she campaigned well Halle Berry she even fixed them breakfast and as I explained to her that is more than fair that Halle Berry would choose to do that, but you'll have to understand and please forgive us that Monique's not going to pull any cereal, not a glass of orange <laughs> no juice, scrapple. not a cut of scrapple, <laughs> not an orange slice of sliver, because humbly she would feel like she was pandering for an award. Mm. And if someone else does it, that's their right. However, she's saying, I put more value on my family than I do on the fame since you are offering me no finances. So mm -hmm. you'll have to excuse me for being so terrible that I would not allow my wife to get raped by the system. Come on. And instead, because historically, black men have stood back and they watched their, man, their woman get raped by the master. And then the cognitive dissonance comes into play. Now, there have been rumors that Monique and Sydney are in an open marriage because of their new podcast titled Open Relationship. Now, the couple are opening up about the details of their marriage, and they clarified what Monique meant in the past when she made headlines for referring to their relationship as open. They sparked rumors about them that ranged from accusing them of being swingers to actually having marital trouble. Now, apparently none of this is true. Now, it all started back with an Essence interview. Monique says, in 2006, I did an article in Essence magazine with Jill Scott saying that I was in an open relationship. And when I tell you back then, people lost their minds. Now, when I first told Sydney that I told Jill that in the interview, he said, mama, that's gonna backfire on you. A lot of people have asked, what does it mean? Initially, when I asked for it, it was because I wanted to continue to see the gentleman that I was seeing, and I felt comfortable telling my best friend. So when I sat down and said this, this is what I want initially, it was because I wanted to still have sex with who I was seeing, and I didn't want it to be where I was keeping anything from my best friend, meaning Sydney. That's how it initially started. And when I tell you the conversations that we've had, it has taken me to a different place where I'm not even thinking of another man sexually, but still open to it. Now, it was all Monique's idea and not Sydney's. Now, when you pull up, you pull up other celebrities in open marriages, you see Will and Jada, Monique said. Whoever the person is, the author of that article, they will say, well, we can understand why they would be in an open marriage. They both are beautiful people. When they start talking about Brad and Angelina, they said, well, we can understand they're both beautiful people. The moment it got to my damn picture with my husband, they said, Oh, we hope Monique not going to let him just use her like that because society looks at me and they see a woman that looks like she couldn't possibly have a man that looks like that if they were not something else involved in it. She's going to let this man do anything he wants to do because she's famous and she has money and now she can have whatever she wants. But she's going to let the man use her and abuse her. No one knew it wasn't Sydney's idea to have an open marriage. It was mine. I want to say that again. It was not Sydney's idea to have an open marriage. It was mine. But Monique's ego got the best of her. Monique said, initially, when I said it, I had the attitude of whoever makes the money makes the rules. And because I'm famous and I have the money, I can do what I want to do. But then he said to me in the Bahamas, well, mama, you know, if you can see other men, then I can see other women. 
and then I said well that's not what I was talking about because I'm the famous one not you and I have the money you can't do that what I had to learn is this thing called reciprocating and that was very hard for me because my ego would get in the way but it seems that the online comments is what actually hurt them Monique says we're so closed off and we're so used to doing things the way people think we should do things and we wanted to put it out there so that people understood it because when I tell you some of the Instagrams and some of the comments, I was getting daddy. I was having low self-esteem. I was having no self-worth. I was trash. And then everyone wanted to include God. It's against God. It's a big sin. And how could you say you love the Lord when you let your man lay with other women? And then Sydney jumped in and said, right, they didn't think about what would happen if you decided to lay with other men. Now, their feelings have since changed. Monique says, we're dealing with 11 years of being together and there's the evolution of what an open marriage means. Because when you are a father and a mother of three children, there's not a whole lot of time to be doing a whole lot of slinging. Now, there's not a whole lot of menage a trois and all of that. In fact, none, Sydney added. But that's what people thought. They thought we were having these orgies. And I'm sorry, Daddy, Monique said, but we wasn't doing that. Now, this is how they define an open relationship now. So it's not just an open relationship from a sexual standpoint. It's an open relationship in terms of dialogue that you're having with your spouse, your mate, your sons, your daughters, your mothers, your father, because we always hear someone is important. Be yourself. But that's only when it's politically correct. When you've fallen into the boundaries of what people expect you to be, as opposed to you being yourself. When it is against the proverbial norm, but what we find is against the norm is really the norm. Now, of course, they're still happy. This is not going to change the dynamic of our relationship, Sydney says, because I'm in love with this woman. I've been involved with someone for 33 years of my life since we were kids. I've known her longer than I haven't known her. So when you start saying to yourself, the spirit that you came into this universe with is the spirit that you're going to exit this world with. Are you going to be yourself through having an open conversation and an open dialogue and an open relationship? So y'all drop down in the comments and let me know what you think about this couple. They have been in the news, been in the blogs lately. And a lot of people are saying they are sick of them talking. So let me know what you think about them. Drop down in the comments below. Well, this has been an interesting video. It is safe to say that Monique has had an illustrious career. It's been full of ups and downs, twists and turns. But what is in store for Monique? We know that her career is back on the rise. It is back on the mend. But with this public display, this debacle that she's been going through with D.L. Hughley, some are saying, Monique, you're going to be canceled. Some are saying, Monique, that's it. Some are saying she has reached the end of the road. So what do you guys think about it? Can she come back from what has been going on recently? Do you think that she's canceled? Drop down in the comments and let me know. We know that she's estranged from her family. We know that, you know, she has an older son that she's estranged with. So drop down in the comments and let me know what you think about that as well. Should Monique take some time away from the spotlight and get her family life in order? Drop down in the comments. Let me know what you think. This has been another edition of the Sweet Pea Diaries. If you like this video, drop down in the comment section and let me know what else you would like to see me do a documentary on. So make sure you like this video, share this video, but most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and I will catch you on the next one. Bye.